last uh, uh, talk today, uh, and this is uh, going to be delivered by Professor John Stone, who is known to many of us already. Uh, he's a professor of neurology and a consultant neurologist in Scotland at Edinburgh, and he's uh, He's concentrated on functional neurological disorders, uh, which is a, a, a real problem uh, in movement disorders and MS is close behind in, in, that, uh, in that area. And this condition, a functional neurological disorder, uh, is now um, represented by a global society. It was established by Professor Stone and Mark Hallett and others. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, there's no one better f to talk to us about this uh, this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So I am going to cover a bit about FND today, but I was asked to talk about the misdiagnosis and undiagnosis of MS. So that's what I'm so I'm so I'm, so I'm going to stick to that mainly, and I'm going to try and stick to time because I'm aware many of you will, will have travel plans for uh, for this. So I'll try not to go over, even though we're running a bit late. Um, so those are my conflicts of interest, mainly related to, to FND, and I don't think they really impact on today's talk. So I'm going to look at the literature that we have about how often MS is given as, a, as an incorrect diagnosis, and when it turns out to be something else, I'll do a little bit about the other way around, but mostly about when MS is, is misdiagnosed. Uh, and I'm not really going to cover other inflammatory conditions. So I'm not going to be talking about when MS turns out to be NMO and things like that, because I think you all know about that. And what are the main diagnostic categories when, when people get it wrong, when they call things MS that's not MS? It's quite a serious thing to do. Um, and I'm going to cover a bit about the difference between misdiagnosis and comorbidity, because I think that's a really important distinction. It doesn't have to be either or. And then say something about just some clinical ideas, it's really not a very uh, well-researched area at all about what do you do with a patient where, they, where you have to undiagnose MS? How do you do that? What kind of impact does it have on the patient? And I'll just give some mainly personal thoughts about that as well. So there's some articles here that you might find interesting and relevant to this talk, and there's a QR code there just to enable you to get hold of those in a Dropbox folder. And I'll, I'll show it at the end as well, if you miss it there. In particular, my interest in this came writing an article with Andrew Solomon there at the top left. Andrew had, is, a, is an MS neurologist from Vermont who's done much of the best work, I think, in sort of bringing together the, the literature on, on misdiagnosis. So I contacted him and said, well, how about we write an article about FND and MS? Because actually there hadn't actually been one, even though it's something clinically that people talk about. And I particularly uh, uh, want to promote the article at the bottom there by Jan Koberg and colleagues about undiagnosis, because I think there's very little out there for neurologists about how to handle this situation clinically when you're undiagnosing a, a condition. So when you think about misdiagnosis, it, it occurs at various levels in the system um, from various doctors. And I think perhaps one of the first places to start here is what happens in primary care, because GPs might not tell people that they've got MS, but for patients, it often feels like they have been told they've got MS because the GP will say, I'm really worried this is MS, and the patient will go out of the door thinking, I've got MS. The G my GP thinks I've got MS. And this is a referral that I had just two weeks ago. Um, thank you for seeing this 50-year-old woman with a one-month history of muscle cramping and fatigue, weight loss, tearful, some bladder symptoms. It's a sort of fairly non-specific group of symptoms, really, isn't it? But top of the letter, query, query, new MS, query, post-COVID. So I'm not, I'm not at all critical of this GP for, for, for this referral. I think it's perfectly reasonable. But when I saw the patient, in fact, although the GP had got this sort of one-month history, I then got a, tw a sort of 20-year history of multiple symptoms with pain, sensory disturbance, exhaustion, memory, etc. I'm sure this is familiar to you from your practice as well. And the patient said to me, well, my GP was really worried this was MS. Now, I don't know if the GP was. It was top of her letter. Uh, the, the daughter was worried it was MS. They knew a friend who had MS. She thought she had MS. Of course, she doesn't have MS. She's got fibromyalgia, a functional disorder. And so we had to go through that instead. So that's not quite an undiagnosis, but it's, it's, getting, it's getting close to it. 
Now, if you look at studies where patients, we've looked at patients like this that are, are sent up to MS centres for a diagnosis of suspected MS. How many of them don't have MS? And it's a high number, and uh, anything between 13 and 60 percent. And lots of these misdiagnoses of, or, or, or diagnoses that are not MS, of course, depends a lot on who's doing the sending, who's doing the assessing, etc. But I think the, the, the general message is it's quite a large number of people out there being told they might have MS, or perhaps told that they probably do, and then it turns out that they don't. And that number's not actually dropping as fast as you might think. You'd think with MRI these days that, that misdiagnosis would be quite rare, uh, but it's not, uh, based on these studies. So, um, yeah, that's, that's going from 1980s to uh, just a few years ago. And this is a study of Andrew's, uh, Andrew Solomon's where he just asked a lot of North American MS specialists to think about the patients that they had seen in their clinic who, where, where they'd had to undiagnose MS. Um, so it wasn't an epidemiological study, this one. It was more of a sort of survey. But they all agreed that they'd seen, they, they were having to do this quite a lot. They'd all, 95% had had to do it in the last year, and they he figured out it was at least 600 patients in the last year between all these specialists. It's a lot of patients. So this is what they were undiagnosing in MS into. Um, and actually, if you, but if you look at those categories, a couple of them there, I'm not sure that those are necessarily, they're sort of more radiological slash clinical diagnoses rather than the clinical diagnoses, small vessel disease. So you can have small vessel disease, of course, and it doesn't mean that your neurological symptoms relate to cerebrovascular disease. They might relate to something else. And most of these... Uh, types of misdiagnosis study come out with the, with the top causes being small vessel disease slash ischemia, although I do wonder about some of those, migraine and functional disorders, and then other neuroinflammatory things and other, and other conditions that we'll all be familiar with. So those are, the, those are the top causes, really. Now, when you get to secondary care, you'd think the risk of misdiagnosis would be a bit low, and I'm not sure these studies are that reflective of real practice, to be honest, because the, the percentage being Mr. Who, who don't have MS still seems very high, even in some recent studies, going up to 30%, 18% in a recent study there. So I'm not sure. I think that depends when the, when, when the label's being, being put on, but it's certainly an issue, and, and perhaps higher than you might think. And this is another stu study of Andrews looking at uh, misdiagnosis of MS. This, is, this was a more of a uh, sort of e uh, a kind of epidemiological study looking at 110 patients with, a, with an incorrect diagnosis of MS. And once again, you're seeing migraine at the top. You're seeing functional disorders, uh, fibromyalgia, which of course, you know, I suppose the concentration fatigue, but not really the pain. Uh, so I'm not sure how that ends up being diagnosed as MS. So I suspect a lot of these patients within the migraine, small vessel disease, fibromyalgia categories, if you looked at them and thought, well, how did this person end up with MS? It's probably because they've got a functional neurological symptom, sensory disturbance, weakness of a limb, etc. Now these patients are receiving DMTs. You can see here on the right, uh, having DMTs over 10 years, many of them. Um, the duration of these misdiagnoses is long. So... Imagine having a diag uh, an incorrect diagnosis of MS for that long and imagine receiving the wrong drug for that long as well. So these were some interesting conclusions from Andrew from that, from that study about what, what tends to go wrong. Why do these patients end up with a misdiagnosis? Um, quite a lot to do with interpretation of symptoms as being relapses. Um, particularly past symptoms, it's quite easy, isn't it? If someone has an episode of symptoms to say, well, that was probably a relapse, um, a new uh, or, or an intercurrent sensory symptom, call it, do you call that an MS relapse or not? Quite a lot of over-interpretation of radiology, small sort of periventricular lesions. Um, even this, this business of if you've got different MRI scanners, are, are you actually seeing a new lesion or was that lesion on the original scan? It's just that you missed it on the slice you were looking at. Um, and one of the things that Andrew says, this is Andrew saying it, not me, <laughs> is 
is this a tendency for, for anyone who's, who's in a particular specialty, and I'm probably guilty of this as well in FND, that if, you, if, if you're thinking about MS all day long, it's quite easy just to carry on thinking about MS and not think about other neurological conditions, particularly functional symptoms which an FND, which traditionally have been a kind of black hole of neurology and people think, well, is, is it really a thing? Can we make a positive diagnosis? Just for a little bit of balance, I thought I'd show you the data looking at misdiagnosis the other way around. How often do people with, who do actually have MS get told they've got FND? Uh, well, I've been involved in most of those, uh, those two studies uh, the lower two there, and the top one is a systematic review of all of the literature on that. And actually, there's only eight cases of MS there uh, out of two and a half thousand people with FND. Now, that doesn't mean that it's, I, you know, I think it's, I think that happens more than that, but it certainly doesn't appear to be more common that way around compared to the other way around. So it looks to me, I think there's quite a lot of literature, that people with FND are more commonly told they've got MS than the other way around. So we've thought a bit about misdiagnosis, but I think we have to think as well about comorbidity. This is based on the card game Top Trumps that was popular in the UK when, in the 1970s when I was growing up and you'd have a card of a car or something and your friend would have a card and you have to work out which one was better. Now if we were playing Top Trumps with neurological conditions, MS would be FND every single time on every, on every sort of... Uh, Factor and, and FND would be one of those cards, if you got it, if you go, oh no, I've got a terrible card here because it's got, it's got nothing going for it except for being really, really common. And actually, it is actually disabling. But anyway. So in my experience, and of course my experience is a little biased, but uh, I think MS is often a comorbidity to some of these other conditions, migraine, fibromyalgia, and FND but it's a comorbidity that's been very poorly studied. So Gowers, just round the corner in 1893, uh, used the H word, um, sorry for anyone watching this on, on the recording, but you know, co commented that FND and uh, emotional disturbances, interesting that he separates those, are common in MS, even in men. Okay. So noticing that these things seem to, be, seem to happen more often than by chance. There's been virtually no studies on comorbidity of FND and MS. We did, one, we, we, we did one with a fairly basic methodology about 10 years ago, suggesting maybe about 13% of patients with MS are rated by their physician as having symptoms that are not that explained by the MS diagnosis. And there's been another recent interesting study from uh, Germany suggesting that if you look carefully, you find positive evidence of FND in about perhaps about 7% percent of patients. So that's my experience. I'm going to talk about some of these uh, clinical cases shortly. So here's a patient that I, that I was sent from one of my colleagues in the, in the MS clinic, a lady in her mid-40s with a very definite and definite diagnosis of relapsing uh, remitting MS. The scan was typical. She has positive bands but a fairly low lesion load and no particularly critical lesions on the scan but a really severe disability. So she turned up to clinic in an electric wheelchair, very disabled, um, and the question was, does she have FND as well? And indeed she did, in spades. So she had multiple positive features of FND, a hoover sign, hip abductor shine, which I'll show you in a minute, a functional tremor, a functional dystonia of her ankle. So, for, so her diagnosis was multiple sclerosis and FND. She had a dual diagnosis. It wasn't a misdiagnosis of MS. She had both. And, this, and we can make these diagnoses now because FND is not a diagnosis of exclusion. It's a diagnosis you make by looking for clear evidence of FND. So for her, an explanation that she actually had two conditions and that her FND had probably been triggered by Having MS, having a neurological condition is one of the strongest risk factors for developing FND. And then changing her treatment and saying, well, actually, you've got this comorbidity here, which has specific treatment now, FND-focused physio, which is different to the kind of physio you'd give for MS, FND-focused psychological therapy. And by the end of that treatment, she was actually able to walk to the bottom of her garden with one stick. 
which she was quite amazed about. And it was interesting going through it because initially she was very unsure about this. She was a bit upset that we were questioning whether all of her disability was MS related. But as she went through treatment, um, she gradually became more enthusiastic about the FND diagnosis. She could see that this was something that was worth thinking about because it was potentially reversible. And in fact, when the physio got to the point of working out that her ankle dorsiflexion weakness was MS related and not FND related, she was actually really, really disappointed, which is the kind of response that you want. You want someone to, to realise that it's potentially a good thing if some of, this, some of their disability is FND related. And I'm interested in exploring this more for the, for, from terms of the MS populations. How many, uh, how many of these patients could we identify using, uh, using clinical methods, perhaps sort of uh, laboratory-supported ways of identifying these things? Would it help with MS trials uh, to, to, to identify these comorbidities? So if we're thinking about undiagnosing disease in someone who... Who, who doesn't have MS anymore. I think that's, that's harder than introducing a comorbidity. And in order to think about that, I want you to think about your own identity. I appreciate not everyone here is, uh, is actually a neurologist, but, but just for the, for the sake of simplicity, just think about your identity as a, as a doctor and as a neurologist. Because I think somebody coming along and telling you that, you, that a disease you've had for 10 years is not true is rather similar to someone coming along at work and saying, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, we've made a horrible mistake, you're not actually a doctor. I'm, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> it was just a mistake. You know, I mean, you, you sort of looked a bit like a doctor and we thought you were a doctor, but, but actually you're not. Um, that's how patients with MS who are undiagnosed will feel. If you want to just think about how, how distressing that would be. And I, just to give you some... But I think there's, so there's sort of gradations of that. So if you said to a patient, you've, you haven't got MS, you've got neuromyelitis optica, that's not quite so bad, is it? That's, that's a bit like saying you aren't a neurologist, you're a neuroradiologist. I mean, it's not quite the same thing, but it's, it's, it's in the same sort of ballpark. You haven't got MS, you've got cerebrovascular disease. Well, that is a bit different, really, isn't it? But it's still OK, uh, but it's still quite different. Bit of a shock. What about you haven't got MS, you've got FND? Now, I did think carefully about what, <laughs> what picture to put here, and I decided not to put one in the end, because I was going to offend, <laughs> offend people with FND who definitely have had enough offence already. Uh, but, yeah, it's a bit like saying, you aren't a neurologist, but I'm really not sure what you are, in fact. Whatever it is, it's not really my problem. So that, that's how people with MS, with FND, who've been misdiagnosed as MS, might feel. And this is how this lady felt, who's uh, in her 50s, was t did have transverse myelitis, almost certainly, about 20 years ago, single episode, <clears throat> and then, r rather like the other lady, became very disabled, was using a wheelchair, ran the local MS group, but had multiple positive features of FND, and no real evidence of MS on reinvestigation. And she had this clinical sign, which is the hip abductor sign. Against my hand here. We can see when we do that. You're stronger than I am. Yeah. And I can't push that knee in. Um, and then I want, let's try and do the same thing with this knee. So stop me from pushing in. Push out as strong as you can. But I'm winning there. Yeah. Pushing your knee in. Let's go back to this side. I want you to push out again as hard as you can. Really stop me. Push, 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 push. Now, when we do that, we can see that actually what's happening over on the right side is that I can't, it's become much stronger and I can't push the knee in now. So it's brought out the automatic movement. So our physical signs of FND are, are demonstrating that there's normal automatic movement even though there's an impairment of voluntary movement. And that has quite profound implications for both sh actually persuading the patient at the bedside that they have this condition but also uh, carrying that through into, th into physiotherapy because we want therapies that promote automatic movement and not therapies that make someone think really hard about their leg because that will, that's when it's worse. And that's really the basis of our new uh, types of physiotherapy, for example, for FND, but also some of the psychological therapies as well.
coming from an understanding of how we make these diagnoses. So as I've mentioned, FND is a rule-in diagnosis now, it's not a rule-out one. Um, there's evidence-based treatment. I'm really glad to see it becoming more mainstream within neurology. Some articles here in JAMA Neurology and recently uh, Lancet Neurology. And we don't have enormous amounts of evidence yet, but we have very promising randomised control evidence, for example, for FND-focused physio. This study here led by Glenn Nielsen and a larger study about to report. So what happened to this lady? You'd think she might be quite pleased that she doesn't have MS. Eventually, perhaps she might be pleased. Well, she wasn't really. Uh, I mean, we didn't, obviously she had had transverse myelitis. She did understand why she, why she had a diagnosis of FND. And much like the last lady, actually did really well and got to the point of walking with one stick and was really credited her physio for making a big difference. But for her, she felt that the last 15 years of her life, had, uh, she'd been living a lie about her diagnosis. She was really angry with the fact that she was angry that she'd been diagnosed with MS. She was also angry that she hadn't had access to treatment for FND 15 years ago. Now, I did say to her, well, I'm not sure that that would have happened, uh, but it's an interesting case because she's actually thinking of legal action for, for someone missing a diagnosis of FND, which you know, 20 years ago would have been quite an extraordinary thing to happen, but it kind of makes sense. You don't want to miss potentially treatable conditions. You don't want to miss thyroid, low B12, FND, I would say. So, so she, she was happy that she'd been, that the correct diagnosis had been found, but she is still angry about it, to be honest. Um, I just wanted to show you some some examples of treatment. This is a lady, this is a different lady with a functional gait disorder, came to see me not that long ago. She had a triple PD, which is a type of functional dizziness and a functional gait disorder. She's wobbling about all over the place. She's embarrassed about going outside. She'd had this for about four years. And this is her within about, within, uh, about three months of treatment with a normal gait, with that, with that sort of approach. Now, people always show their best cases. I'm not suggesting this happens every time, but I'm just trying to get across the idea that if we can make, have those sorts of outcomes for some of our FND patients, it's worth making an effort. And again, I'm guilty of showing you a good case here because I just got this card last week from a patient, another patient with a functional gait disorder who's talking about what a difference it made to have a diagnosis, to work with a physio who understands this condition it's pretty, sim it's pretty simple stuff, really. It's not, it's not really rocket science. It's just clinical care. So she is feeling hugely improved and no longer fearful of going, going about. So I think we should be up trying to undiagnose people, if we, if we can, and particularly if we've got an FND diagnosis on the cards. In that study from Andrew Solomon, it was interesting, two-thirds of the neurologists said that they found undiagnosis much harder than giving a diagnosis of MS, which I think probably is true. Both, both are difficult, of course, but I think undiagnosis even more so. And interestingly, one in six, thereabouts, said that they had chosen sometimes to not actually undiagnose a patient. So they know the patient doesn't have MS, they decide not to tell the patient, which is an interesting ethical issue. It was interesting also that was more likely in younger specialists, why did they do that? Uh, because the patient wasn't on a DMT, because they thought it would be too harmful to the patient to tell them they didn't have MS, because they thought it was benign and does it really matter? Um, fear of that the patient would lose financial support if they lost their diagnosis. And in some countries, these things are diagnosis dependent rather than disability dependent. Um, so an interesting ethical problem. Is it ever okay not to undiagnose? So just finally, just thinking about this undiagnosis process, I've, I, I really would encourage you, don't underestimate how p potentially traumatic it is and don't make it into a good news story for the patient necessarily. If, it's, if, you've had a long di if they've had a diagnosis for a long time, it doesn't matter what it is, it's going to be a shock and difficult for the patient. There's also a, that loss of trust as well. If those doctors got it wrong 10 years ago, how come... Is it, why isn't it possible that you've got it wrong now? So these things throw up difficulties with general 
loss of trust in doctors uh, altogether. And if possible, if the patient has neurological symptoms, please try and make a diagnosis rather than just saying, oh, they're neurological symptoms. Yeah, I mean, not, not all, you know, don't, don't pigeonhole things into FND if it's not FND and they don't have clear, clear features of that. But it should really be a re-diagnosis. And I've talked about diagnosis of inclusion. Why is it important? Because you might need to stop harmful treatments or start helpful ones for some of these conditions, particularly FND, but maybe migraine and vascular disease as well. And in doing that, I think it's really important not to be critical of uh, past colleagues who've made these diagnoses, explain to the patient why things would have, would have looked different, the benefit of hindsight, uh, change in medical knowledge, change in understanding of FND, for example. So it takes time. And, and seeing the patient again, I think, regardless of what you've undiagnosed, is important. So that, those, that's my talk, I think. Uh, MS misdiagnosis is surprisingly still, according to the literature anyway, a common issue, although I think we need better studies. Um, and those are the most common misdiagnoses. Think about comorbidity and handle undiagnosis carefully. Um, thank you to my colleagues here in Edinburgh. Uh, we, we have an FND research group, which is multidisciplinary. As you can see, they're working between neurology and psychiatry, and that's the... QR code for those papers if you're interested to, to read more. Thanks very much. Thank you.